one up that has to do with the theme. Uh, th those are two hands on a potter's wheel. Yep. It is molding the clay. And we sang the opening uh, verse that we would uh, be the potter, or he, he would be the potter and we would be the clay. And I think that uh, Al chooses the songs every Sunday, and I think that's a, a, a wonderful one. That's a, a real message. And even those, most of us in here are over 30, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> except, uh, except physically or mentally. Except for Judy, it's her birthday. <laughs> except for my wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three times. Oh, wow. You must like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, anyway, it is a message even for us people who are mature citizens. We are continually praying God will be molding us into the shape that He wants. We, we, the difference between us and the clay is we can yield. We can heal, and we can also fight it. So, anyway, it, it, it's a it's a message. It's a prayer. God help me to do something which is not natural, and that is to yield to something else, somebody else. And we that person is is God. Um, I left the maps up here, just uh, or on the. Uh, uh, screen from from last time, uh, and I'm not going to dwell on it. But uh, if you notice this last week in the news, the uh, fighting has increased down here on this land, tiny little strip of land, and it is increased in the north on uh, this border. They are attacking here. They're sending drones, and then this morning, uh, if you watch the news, they have now started. Uh, sending drones with bombs towards Tel Aviv, which is uh, their large city on the, on the coast. Now, Tel Aviv um, is not the capital of, of Israel. Jerusalem is, although uh, Israel has to fight to call their own capital the capital because the world uh, does not recognize that. And most of the uh, countries that have embassies still have them in Tel Aviv because they fail to recognize Jerusalem. If you remember when Donald Trump was president, last time he made a very brave move and moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Okay, and several countries have followed since then and they're making, recognizing Jerusalem as the undivided capital of Israel, although most of the world does not. Uh, just to, to compare, uh, Jerusalem has less than a, a, somewhere between three quarters of a million and a million people. Okay. Uh, Tel Aviv has over four million people. And the news is, too, lately, people are flooding in it. Jews are coming from all over the world. Now, I don't know if anybody has seen this or how. I, I checked YouTube this morning and something came up that uh, regarding Gaza, it said that there's a, there was a, a vision that the people saw there of Christ. That's a, a mirage, not a mirage, but a bright light and Christ. And they say that there's a, quite a few millions of Muslims came to know came uh, trusting Christ. Anybody hear that? Or? Yeah, I read that yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a lot of Muslims are having visions of Christ in their sleep or actually, you know, and they're turning to become Christians. <coughs> no, I didn't see that, but we need to pray for that too. Right. In, in your own prayer time, pray, pray that Muslims will come to the Lord. Sure. Christ died for them as well. John? Working with uh, Muslim students in Denver, uh, the few who came to Christ and had to flee because their own parents were given a fatwa to 
kill them by poisoning them. Uh, they initially came to Christ by seeing visions. So I know that in the context of America, we kind of poo-poo this stuff. But those who live in utter darkness uh, need a little bit of light. <laughs> and God gives it to them by dreams and by visions. Angels coming and standing at the foot of their bed. I had an experience, uh, at, excuse me for interrupting, but I had an experience with that with an American in South Los Angeles when I preached, where an engineer, a space engineer, who had married a Korean woman was perplexed with visions and seeing somebody in the room, but he could never identify it. And finally, he identified this white figure that came and stood at the end of his bed and said, there is a man who's going to come and tell you the solution. I preached on demonology that morning in South Los Angeles Baptist Church. And the podium wasn't this low, it was way up there, about eight feet off the ground. And when I closed, this guy got out of his seat, got in the aisle, and he came zooming up the aisle. And he leapt with superhuman strength and stood right by me with nose to nose and said, you're the man, you're the man, you're the man. Well, what do you do? <laughs> I think I was scared. <laughs> and he said, I said to the pastor and to the elders, please take this man into a counseling room somewhere. I talked to the congregation and told them what was happening. His story was absolutely amazing. His wife was a worshiper of ancestors. And she had an altar on their fireplace altar that she maintained every day. But he, being a scientist with NASA, of course couldn't <laughs> accept that, because that wasn't science. And so he left himself completely open to the spiritual forces of this dark world, and it had plagued him. So. He got his answer before committing suicide. He got his answer, you're the man. And that day he became a Christian. His wife threw out the altar, uh, burned all the trash and stopped her ancestor worship. And the children were all deaf. And they became a strong witness for Christ in the, yeah. in the glory and community in South Los Angeles. But I, I'm telling you, we, we tend to poo-poo this stuff. But believe it in areas where there's very little light and for a Muslim to see an angel or a vision of the cross or something may be their first starting point. It was a Pakistani woman who wrote a book, I Dare to Call Him Father. Nobody knew that she was a Christian. She was a very famous powerful politician woman in the Pakistani uh, Muslim community. But she became a Christian because of a vision. And she lived secretly for many, many years. And finally, in prayer one day, she was able to call God her father. Mm -hmm. And then she went public. And she wrote this book. And it's a fabulous book. Oh, sorry for interrupting. Well, thank you, thank you, John. I believe it says in the scriptures, too, that in the last days, there will be these kind of things happening, you know. Signs and visions. So we are in the last days, and I believe we're going to see more things. I, I, I think we should be be alert, and we should be. How do we know? How do we know? The Holy Spirit tells us. Correct. We need to be walking close to God so that we can discern. Right. Because there will be false prophets, yeah. too. And we need to be able to tell what's true and what's false. As Baptists, you know, we, we, we've been trained to keep ourselves separate from the Pentecostals. So, I mean, and that uh, is, is probably not a bad thing in itself, but uh, it maybe makes us a little 
on the other side <laughs> and unwilling to accept some of these things, you know, uh, if, if, if a brother like, like John says something, I, I, I believe that's, that's it, that's true. Yeah. And, uh, but that is not my final determination, is the Holy Spirit and working with, with Him. And what Al said too is, it, it is uh, we're going to see some things, I think, uh, some unusual things as we get, get closer to the last days. And in the meantime, our mission is still the same, is to portray the love of Christ and spread the gospel. Yeah. So let's let's stick to that. All right. And God will bring the, the other. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, to mention that because the war is heating up and uh, uh, there's it, a lot of gunfire being exchanged right here. And uh, it, it can't go anywhere except to get get worse. And so just something to watch this week because it does it is related to uh, the last days. Uh, this is that other map again, which shows the uh, geography of Israel. Okay. Now down here, this is dry, but they have irrigated it and have uh, farms and so on. Things going down there, I've flown over it, looked at it, turned those feet, and looked down there, and you see acres and acres of, of trees and vines, tomatoes, and potatoes, and any kind of a crop you would imagine. It's very productive. Uh, and then the coastal plains here, which includes Tel Aviv, this is Haifa up here, and then the Golan Heights, <coughs> about here, this high point, which looks down on Syria. Here's the border, right here, so you can stand here and you can look down and see the people in Syria doing their uh, farming, fixing roads, doing whatever they do. So it's all very close together. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, uh, before, but I uh, tell the story. A friend of mine was uh, in uh, his uh, on his back porch. Uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, reading the newspaper in the evening, it was getting dark, and he could see the flashes of light where his sons were in the army fighting the war. And so he was he was relaxing after work, just like anybody else after supper, and reading the paper, and his sons within sight, <laughs> the war was going on. Uh, that's how close together things are, and how, uh, how it kind of... Uh, kind of goes there, you, you uh, uh, don't even realize how close, close you are. I, I was there one time and a, and a rocket exploded 12 miles away. Okay, well, you know, uh, I didn't even know it. I read about in the paper the next morning. But 12 miles, that's just the, that's less than from here to Salem. Almost a little more than from here to Mendo. Uh, and th they are used to that. Uh, being being that close to to uh, uh, war and, and fighting. What's sad is you can actually get used to it. You can what? What's sad is you can actually get used to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that is sad. It, it is sad that you can you can actually get used to that, to living like that. We also, have like a bomb shelter too that they're in their houses that they're building. Mm -hmm. they have a, some kind of a shelter, safely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's common for the, the little kids in school, you know, mom attack, get under your desk, or go to the shelter if you're close, whatever it is. You know, oh, is this part of daily life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, it's, it's really something. But uh, in spite of that, scripture is being fulfilled because there was an article on the news this morning about the number of immigrants to Israel, yeah. Jews from all over the world, still Massive. being led say, to go back to their homeland. It's safer in Israel than it is in New York, I say. It's safer. As a matter of fact, I read an article just the other day. Some people from Portland are moving to Israel because they said it's safer in Israel where there's gunfire than yeah. it is in Portland, Oregon. That, that, that is possibly very true. Yeah. Um, I've, been, I've been there six times. 
and felt safe every time. Yeah. That's absolutely safe. Uh, but it, it is kind of psychological too. At one time we, we were on the bus and we could hear the explosion of uh, a um, bomb in the bus station which killed the woman and we, the things just went on. It was just part of the thing in life. Anyway, uh, I've left this up here just again so we can see what the kind of geography it is. The lowest spot on Earth, right here, this line is the uh, boundary, actually, of Israel, the eastern boundary, uh, right down this, this fall line. Uh, and uh, everything that goes in and out uh, from the east to west has to go through the mountains or through the passes here and up above. Uh, it, it's just a, a weird country, geographically, geographically. Uh, but this is the one that God chose to bless and uh, is uh, intended to do that. Okay, let's go to Hebrews. And with any luck, we, we can get through uh, this chapter today. Uh, we left off at the verse 9 to 10. We, we, let's reread 9 and, and go, go ahead here. Paul says, but we see, if it is Paul, excuse me, <clears throat> but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And uh, verse 10, for it became him for whom all things, and by whom all things, uh, now they talk about Jesus, he, he was made, he, it was made by him, but who was it made for? Christ. Him. Yeah, Christ. He was made, uh, he made it for himself. He, he was uh, the agent of creation. He, in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Okay. Now, Jesus was perfect, wasn't he? Yes. Why would he have to be made perfect? Because okay. he was born into a corrupted body in a corrupted world. He was in, a, in, in that instant, but at the same time, uh, he, he was in a corrupted body in a corrupted world, but at the same time, he was still every bit God. Yes. He was every bit God and every bit man at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> if your version says it a little bit differently, but the way I read this is, he became the perfect captain. He went through some experience for us that we could not do. Remember the old song? Uh, he paid a debt he had no, did not owe, yeah. and I owed a debt I could not pay. And then, I, mean, I needed someone to wash my sins away. That's, that's what he did. He was the perfect one to do that when he died on the cross because things were made by him, things were made for him. He was God, but he was made, the station in life was made lower then low for a period of time so that he could be our intercessor and me. Philippians 2 is a real good chapter to read along with this same topic here. <clears throat> you know that uh, it says that we, we are to have the attitude which was in Christ Jesus starting with verse 5 who although he existed in the form of God and, and did not and he was equally with God, did not regard equality with God, but he humbled himself. And he became, you know, uh, took on the form of man and, uh, and died on the cross. He did all of that. God so loved the world. He did all of that for us, for yeah. humanity. And, uh, and humanity <coughs> still, you know, he came on his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, chapter 1 of uh, the Gospel of John, uh, to them he gives the, 
of the authority to become the children of God. And, and of course, I'm praying that each one of us has accepted him and put our full trust in him. Yeah. So we are his children. But so that was a Christ perfect plan. It. That was the plan, right? Yeah, yeah. To have someone, uh, he couldn't stand there and say, I'm going to suffer with you and for you unless he had actually been there. So God himself. Yeah. Amazing. What a wonderful salvation. What a wonderful plan. There's a couple of points. Number one, the death that he died was a human death. Right. It's amazing to me that people who sort of think that he died a spiritual death, <coughs> he died a real human death with all of its suffering. Remember how he died. And today there is a man who has gone through all of that sitting at the right hand of the Father who intercedes for us. This word perfect, I looked it up in uh, the Greek, uh, <coughs> whatever. Uh, and uh, it's more the idea of complete or sufficient because he's talking about the land of God that takes away the sin of the world. He died as a sacrificial lamb. That's the complete picture here. And it says that he, both he who makes men holy and those who are being made holy, the same idea is that he was an unblemished lamb and he is making us unblemished and acceptable to God in our lives, and that ought to make us tingle with joy, I would think. You know, we ought to start dancing with the tambourine around here, because we have been made perfect in God's family, as is what? His children and his heirs. My goodness. Why don't we get excited about this? <laughs> Amen. Thank you. That helps us get excited. <laughs> but the one thing that I find is just so hard to accept within myself is that I am a sister to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I I cannot quite accept that I, that that's me. I I think we can all identify with that. Yeah. See, I'm. I am God's brother, Jesus' brother, uh, but uh, we have one father. <coughs> yeah. If you read ahead, it says, and here I am and the children God has given me. <laughs> Dorothy? Uh, because we are forgiven no matter what, we should, that should motivate us to Try harder to be like Jesus. Uh, yes, as long as we're not trying to earn our salvation. No, but I we, mean not, not, right. not, not, right. not to step over the line into sin. Yeah, no, no. Uh, we, we should be yielding our members continually and praying to God and attempting to fulfill what we have been given. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, uh, in fact, uh, along that line, if people are not trying to do that, I, I question their salvation. Yeah. If they say, oh, well, now you can go do anything you want, you say, mm -hmm. can't lose your salvation, uh, that indicates a bad attitude. Did they really have salvation? Yeah, were they really saved? And probably not. Al? Yeah. Yeah. Just reminds me, and, uh, and it's, it's what the scripture says, it says, in, in, uh, 1 John 3, starting with verse 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for because we shall see him as he is. But then it goes on to say in verse 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself, just as he is pure. So we are to... Uh, 
if we realize who we are in Christ, we need to continue, uh, seek to honor him in the power of the Holy Spirit, which he has given us for that, th for that purpose, that we might be able to live and, right, and do right. it well. And I think, uh, uh, Al, the time that we fully realize will be when we are given our crowns of glory and we look at Jesus and we throw him at his feet. Right. Because our righteousness is nothing compared to him. No, no, yes. no, no. Okay, let's, uh, I'll read 11 through 15 here. Uh, for both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. Now, depending on the version you're reading here, um, some of them say all are of one Father. Uh, I'm reading here the old King James, and I think the NSA, the NASB, and I, I looked it up in several different ones. Uh, but uh, I have, from a previous sermon, I have written in, in my margins, the word Father, all of one Father. Okay, so uh, that makes us brethren and sister. Okay. Uh, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, and I will sing praise unto thee. And, uh, you know, in the English of that time, uh, you know, the wolf people are making us say he, she, and all of this. The word meant brothers and sisters. Yeah. It meant siblings more than just brethren. Uh, okay. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. I think that's interesting. Uh, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God has giving, given me. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same. So as he, he became flesh and blood, so he could take these children as flesh and blood. Identify with them, with, with us. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Okay. How did Jesus destroy the power of death? Rising, rising. resurrection. Rose. Yeah, yep. rose again. Couldn't keep him. Uh, physically, Jesus' body was dead. Met all the requirements of being dead. <coughs> Spiritually, he was not dead. And that's the way we will die. You know, they, they uh, uh, we will look at a person and, and he, he dies, but immediately he's in heaven. Yeah. yeah. And we'll be uh, commemorating a, a life that was this Saturday. A uh, person who was really in our congregation a very short time, but made quite an impact. Uh, Jeff May. Yeah. And um, we know that. When he left this life, he was immediately with Jesus. Yeah. So our sadness is not because something bad happened to our loved ones. Our sadness is because we miss them. Yeah. yeah. Huh? There's a whole 99% of the world's global population that can't participate in that, I'm sorry to say. Most of the people I've worked with my whole life, their greatest fear is the fear of death. And that is the stranglehold that Satan uses to keep them in bondage, is their fear of death. Mm -hmm. A simple tribesman walking along the trail who hears a bird call on the wrong side of the trail, that means it's a death call, and he has to stop right there and find an altar and make an, uh, find a stone or a stump and make an altar there and make some sort of sacrifice there so that he can go on with his trip because of the fear of death. 
Now, is it, John, that you've been around the world and seen a lot of things, isn't that one of the major differences between our faith and theirs is theirs is motivated by fear and ours is, was motivated by love? By hope. And hope, positive. Not fear. Yeah. I mean, it's fear and hope, not fear and love. I mean, the, 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 these people have, they love their families better than we do. Uh, but they live in the constant fear of death. Okay. But they don't, uh, what I was referring to, they believe that they're gods, that they are to be afraid of them, and that their gods don't love them. Is that true or not? The gods don't love them, they're just angry. Yeah. <laughs> angry, okay. okay. And so they have to be appeased. The whole spirit world of animism, which is the world's greatest religion, and nobody knows about it, nobody's talking about it, is when it, the wheel of nature begins to wobble, it can only be put back in balance. Not by taking it to the tire shop, but taking it to the altar, whatever their altar might be, and sacrificing. Oh, goodness. Sorry, I get all worked up about this. But, <laughs> But animism is coming back into our American society in a frightening way. And we're gullible, we're open, we're accepting it. And uh, it frightens me. Because it is... Uh, it's their fear of death that causes them to stay in their bondage. Yeah. Yeah. And when we offer them hope, their fear of dying, if they accept the hope, is what keeps them on the other side. Yeah. And, uh, you know what, John? I'm afraid to die. I, I'm a Christian. Uh, the Holy Spirit is in me. I'm afraid to die. I don't want to die, but I'm going to die. What I'm happy about is after that horrible part of my life is over, I'm going to go out. I think, too, there is a positive aspect to a little bit of, of respect for life. I'm not afraid to die, I'm afraid of the process of dying. Yeah, the yeah, pain. yeah, right. And, um, I, I don't want to say, <clears throat> uh, well, if I die, uh, I'm going to go straight to heaven, which is true. So shoot me. Yeah. No, that, that's, that, that's, that's insane. That's, that, that's not. Uh, and the Apostle Paul <laughs> says it's insane. Yeah. It is. The fear of death is what motivates people. <clears throat> and, and, Anyway, I don't want to labor this anymore, but Jeff Mays and my dear wife at some point accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And at that moment, they were given eternal life. Amen. Mm -hmm. And they walked for years among us, clothed in flesh and blood, but they walked right on into the other dimension in the same spiritual life that they had accepted when they were seven years old. And we don't grasp that. I'm sorry, people, we just don't. We don't ask people how they're doing walking around in your eternal life. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, to be absent from the body, if we have our trust in the Lord, is to be present in, 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 in the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Continue in the walk that we have established. Now, uh, my mom used to say, I, I'm not going to die, I'm just going to open the door and walk through. Right. <laughs> in a sense, that's, that's a, a, a bit. Well, first, I did not hear what Shirley said, which started this whole conversation. So it'd be nice to know the, the logic behind what the conversation just Oh, okay. Shirley said that there, she has a natural fear of death. Okay. Is that? Yeah. And, and so that kind of do it. We and uh, bodily death. And, and I think a, 
uh, a, a fear we should yeah we should pray about that so now but, but a respect for life where we don't want to die we want to be here and uh, serving God I think that is helpful right but get, we have to remember everyone lives forever yeah it's just where you want it, smoking or non-smoking. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Everyone lives for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's our choice. That's right. Let's, let's take a look at uh, a couple of verses here, and we're getting about one more minute, and we're going to be out of time. Uh, okay. Look at Second Peter. And I'm going to read 4 through 9. Uh, you might want to read all of this in context. For if God spared not the angels of sin, but cast them down to hell, delivered them to the chains of darkness and reserved them to judgment, and spares not the old world, but saves Noah, the eighth person, the creature of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with overthrow, making them an example unto them that should live ungodly, and delivered, okay, this is the point that ties in, just lot, uh, this one says, means the righteous lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. In other words, living in this world, we are vexed, we are affected by the things around us. We are affected by what we watch on television. Uh, we're affected by what goes on. Uh, and at that time, the picture that God painted was a flood that destroyed the world and only saved one family. One family. All of the people living in the world today are descendants of Noah. Everyone else was wiped out because God did not tolerate that. I think that is comfort for us if we are in Christ. I think it should make us upset and worry and afraid if we are not. Because who was left alive on the earth? No one. Except the one family that trusted God. And we are, if we know Jesus, we are the family that will be depthalized when all the things that are seen to be happening around us come to fruition. And, so, um, and I think we can close like that. Are you all had your hand up? If you want to, did you? Uh, just a cross reference with Romans uh, 11 22. It says, Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. And uh, we touched that one in our study of Romans, uh, that God is kind to those who believe, but is stern to those who do not. We need to believe that and trust in that. Hey, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for this discussion. I thank you for all of these people that are here and that love you and trust you and study your word and know your word. And, and Lord, we look forward to eternity with you. But we know that we have a few things to accomplish yet here on this earth. Pray that you give us the unctions, the ability, and the inspiration to serve you in whatever days we have left here on earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.